As we continue our novena to St. Peregrine, let us say together the novena prayer. O great St. Peregrine, you have been called the wonder worker because of the numerous miracles which you have obtained from God for those who have had recourse to you. For so many years you bore in your own flesh the debilitating disease of cancer. I seek God's healing. Help me to imitate your enduring faith in the face of my great challenge, that I may trust the Lord as you did in your time of affliction. Help me to find the strength to proclaim God's presence in my life, despite the anguish and fear this disease causes in me and my loved ones. O glorious St. Peregrine, aided in this way by your powerful intercession, I will sing to God now and for all eternity, a song of gratitude for his great goodness and mercy. One of the ways St. Teresa of Avila used to describe her own experience of life was that it was a short night spent in a bad inn. In other words, it's not a place to settle down. So we're all in transit on the road. And in St. Luke's Gospel, Jesus tells a story about the dangers and excitement of the Jerusalem road, the story we know as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And at its center is the road and a mysterious inn. A wounded traveler, a kind stranger, inattentive neighbors. It's about the exposure and the danger of the road and of how it is difficult, if not impossible, to make some journeys by yourself. So the road is the road from Jerusalem to Jericho and people are going up and down it. It's a busy road. But those who use this road are often strangers to each other. They may have the same destination, but they're not making the same journey. Like us, we all have the same destination, but we're not making the same journey. So Jesus, too, is taking his road to Jerusalem, the holy city. So the image of Jerusalem is always touched with longing. It features in our hymns and in our religious poetry. It's an image of accomplishment, of rest, and of peace. And one of the great Latin hymns for the consecration of a church begins... Jerusalem, blessed city, called vision of peace, for she is built in heaven out of living stones, crowned by the angels as by friends a bride. So the road is a road we must all travel to the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly city, our mother. Now Jesus tells this story in response to a question posed by a lawyer, who is my neighbor? Now, you always have to be careful of lawyers' questions. This one seems innocent enough. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, good lawyers never ask questions in court to which they do not know the answer. So when Jesus asks him his question in return, the lawyer knows the answer. He knows, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. But he doesn't quite understand. What Jesus offers him is the chance to make the journey, to join him on the road. So, the lawyer is a little cautious, as his last question shows. Who is my neighbor, he says. Well, in some ways, he's asking that good old Catholic question, how far must I go? How often must I forgive my brother, Peter asks, seven times? Or in reality is asking, where is this journey going to take me? So like the question St. Peter asks, how many times must I forgive my brother? The answer that Jesus gives is more than the lawyer bargained for. And the response is a travel story about a number of people who passed this way on the Jerusalem way, the road of encounter and meeting. Now there's something in this story for all of us. It corresponds to certain stages of our journey. And as we look around at those who share our faith and our church, we sometimes feel perhaps like the poor unfortunate man in the parable who fell among thieves. We can feel that our suffering, our own particular hardship, can be ignored or not even noticed for whatever reason by those who are on the road with us. And sometimes the ties of neighborliness are stretched to the limit and beyond on this journey. So everybody develops techniques of blindness and deafness, of failing to notice certain things because they might provoke embarrassment or inconvenience or because we might find ourselves taking on more than we bargained for. And the episode before the one we heard in today's Gospel, Jesus gives his disciples something of a compliment. It is a welcome break for them 
since he often seems to show his impatience with their slowness and their failure to understand. He says, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you, many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see and never saw it, to hear what you hear and never heard it. So we need to be able to see and hear on the Jerusalem road, but also to do. And this parable is about doing. So two people, significant people, saw this man lying beside the road and left him there for whatever reason. One other, the peripheral person, the marginal one, the one whom Jews could not call neighbor because he was a Samaritan, did good to him. He bound up his wounds, he put him on his own beast and carried him to the inn where he could be nursed back to health. Now the word for inn is an interesting one in the gospel. It means a place of welcome for all. St. John Chrysostom says, The church is the inn which in the journey of this world receives the weary and those that are overcome by the weight of their sins, where, casting aside the burden of sin, the weary traveler may rest, and rested is restored with healthy food. So the church is like this inn, then, this transit station, or this intensive care ward. It's not like any other place. It's the place to which we are carried, just like the poor, wounded, and neglected man on the Jerusalem road. The Samaritan carries him to the inn. He can't make it by himself. He needs to be conveyed there. Now, all of us are carried to the inn of the church by others. We don't make it by ourselves. And we get there, we find it full of other people who have been carried there too. Christ is the landlord of this inn. He chooses his customers. He picks them up on the Jerusalem road. And the church is an inn, not a club. You don't apply for membership of this community. You're called and carried to be nursed back to health. That's why the church is full of such strange people. St. Paul says to the Ephesians, You who once were far off have been brought near in Christ. Well, who is my neighbor? And St. Thomas Aquinas says, It is the person next to me, the person whom the Lord places in my way. The person the Lord is a puts adjacent to me. He places me next to them by placing me in the, the body, his body, by carrying me to himself. So when we look around, we sometimes feel that we have fallen amongst thieves, maybe. There are all kinds of odd people, but that is as it should be. They're all angels disguised as Samaritans. Well, one of the most poignant of all Jesus' healing story for me is the healing of the paralyzed man in St. John's Gospel. And John tells us of how Jesus was in Jerusalem to celebrate a Jewish festival. He doesn't say what it was. And Jesus went to a place called Bethesda, as it's sometimes called by us. It was known as the Sheep Pool. John says it was crowded with sick people, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, waiting for the water in the pool to be moved mysteriously. And the Sheep Pool was surrounded by five porticos. And there are many sick people gathered there, hoping that the water will cure them. Because the waters would sometimes move and stir and seem to be alive, and those who waited patiently there hoped to be the first to get into the water, since it was believed an angel was responsible for agitating the water. And the first to enter the waters would be cured, the first. So it was a case of first come, first cured. Now, you can imagine the atmosphere of earnest hope and desperate disappointment as people struggled or their families fought to ensure that they would be first to benefit from the capricious visitation of the angel. All would be quiet, and then there would be a series of ripples and bubbles, and all of those who were watching keenly would rush to submerge themselves or be submerged in the healing water. And it would only be those who were the fittest amongst the sick or else with the strongest and most aggressive relative who could benefit. So one man has been waiting in hope for 38 years that he will be able to get into the water and to be made whole. Now of all of the people gathered there, and St. John says there were many, all of them desperately hoping for healing, Jesus fixes on this man. John tells us that Jesus saw him lying there. When Jesus sees somebody, it has a peculiar significance. It fixes on him. He understands him. Well, why did he choose this man to approach? John tells us that he knew the man had been there a long time. He also knew why the man had been waiting patiently so long in hope for his turn to enter the waters. 
When Jesus asked him, Do you want to be well or whole? The man answered that there was little chance, since there was no one to put him into the waters when they were stirred. And that's the poignancy. The implication is that he has no friends, no family. He is alone. He is in the loneliness, deepest loneliness of sickness. And he's entered the solitude then of infirmity. There is no one to care for him, no one that cares that much. And this is the one that Jesus sees, not all the others, this one. And he's dependent on the casual charity of strangers, which doesn't extend to troubling to put him in the water. So like the exiled citizens of Jerusalem, he has no one to comfort him. And it's for this reason that Jesus approaches him. The paralyzed man represents more than his own plight. He represents his own people. Now St. John has filled this story with references to the Old Testament. And he wants to show us that Jesus is the fulfillment of the hopes of all those who suffer and wait in patience for redemption. First of all, the people are gathered in the sheep pool. Israel is referred to as the flock of God in the Old Testament. So here then the flock of God is gathered in the sheep pool. Jesus, the good shepherd, has come in search of his lost sheep, the man who has no one to comfort him. And the sheep pool is surrounded by five porticos, which represent the books of the law of Moses. So it's obedience to the law that gathers the people together. But this flock cannot be whole until the good shepherd comes to heal it and the sheep pass through the waters of baptism. So the paralyzed man, who is beyond all human help because he has no one to put him in the water, represents the people who await their redeemer. They can't redeem or heal themselves. They must wait for another. And he's been waiting for 38 years. That's no accidental choice of number. During the Exodus, the people waited at Kadesh on the threshold of the promised land before they could enter it. They had received the law 38 years before, but they were still unable to enter the promised land until God allowed it. And at Kadesh, they were thirsty, since they had no water to drink. So God told Moses to strike the rock with his staff, and living water flowed out. So John will use a similar image in his account of Jesus' death, when blood and water will flow from the side of Christ when it's been struck by a lance. The paralyzed man is Israel. He waits at the frontier of the promised land, which is life in Christ, until he is healed by the living water of the gospel. But what St. John is telling us is that Jesus, the new Moses, but greater than Moses, has accomplished this final exodus. It's his word that heals, and it's by passing through the waters of baptism that we become members of this new people. And then the paralyzed man takes up his mat, as Jesus takes up his cross. So the instrument of his weakness and humiliation and isolation become the triumphant signs of his redemption. Now, at the outset of his gospel, Mark tells us a story about another paralyzed man. The paralyzed in the gospel are important because they are the ones who are totally hopeless and dependent. But unlike the paralyzed man in the pool of Bethesda, the paralyzed man in Mark's gospel has friends and family to rely on and care for him. Mark tells us that Jesus was in Capernaum where the crowds gathered in such great numbers that there was no room for them in the house. A paralyzed man, dependent on those around him, even for the most basic necessities of life, wants to be near Jesus. Four friends carry him on his poor man's bed. Mark repeats the word three times to emphasize it was a poor man's bed. It's not an ordinary bed. It's a makeshift affair, which the poor slept on. And when Jesus sees them lowering their friend down through the roof, he says to the man, your sins are forgiven, because he sees their faith. Now the scribes object, for only God can forgive sins. They see the implications of Jesus' mission, but they refuse to believe in it, even though it's confirmed by signs. Jesus simply knows what the paralytic and his four friends want. He doesn't need to ask them. He sees he knows what the scribes are saying, even though they're saying it in their hearts. The paralytic and his bearers see in Jesus the authority of God to teach and heal. And in being near to Jesus, they can reach the one in whom God's power is present. So the scribes, despite being packed into the crowd and being near Jesus, are the furthest from him. 
And the paralytic and his friends get more than they ask for. He wanted healing, but he gets healing, but also forgiveness, peace, and reconciliation with God. It's a foretaste of the life of heaven. When Jesus heals him, he calls him in Greek technon, which means child. He is a child of God whom God loves. He's raised to a new state. And once carried on a pallet, he now carries his pallet. Once prostrate and unable to walk, he now rises and walks. Once dependent on others, he now returns to his own freely. He is a walking sign of the kingdom and an advertisement for the charity of God. Jesus tells him to get up and walk, but he takes his pallet with him. His poor man's bed is a reminder of what life has been for him before the Lord freed him. Sometimes we want to be near Jesus, but we feel we can't make the journey by ourselves because something holds us back. But nobody makes the journey entirely by themselves. All of us are carried by others, like the poor man on his poor man's bed. The journey began for us when we were adopted as children of God at baptism, when we were carried to the church. Our life in the church is a life of being carried and supported. The poor man takes his bed with him. He has the reminder that this was a sign of his dependence, but it's also a sign of his liberation. He wanted to be near Jesus. And the way we are near to Jesus is by being members of the church, the community of the poor that has been freed from sin. Now in the gospel accounts, of this miraculous cure, the evangelist says that it was in seeing their faith that Jesus came to act. He was touched not only by their family feeling, not only by their care for someone they loved, but also their faith that he could make that person whole. That's why they brought him to Jesus. That's why it's important that we carry each other to the Lord. The task of a disciple is to bring people to the Lord. No one can come to him unless the Father draw him, but we can act as the instruments. We have been commissioned to be his witnesses to all people and to the ends of the earth. Not just to people like us. Not just to those who are close to us. Not to those who are healthy and capable. But to all people. And in carrying them to the Lord, we come to see how he carries us through them. Let us pray together our prayer to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need, that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings, particularly. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen.